Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, everyone for joining uh, this evening's discussion. I'm Tom Zimmerman, and I'm the Programs Director here at the Pacific Council. Uh, we're just thrilled to be hosting tonight's event with the Japanese American National Museum in partnership with our friends over at Skylight Books. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, the Pacific Council is an organization that looks at the ways in which what happens globally impacts us here in California and the ways in which what happens locally can reverberate around the globe. So I really can't think of a topic that is more in line with that project than the one we're gonna be here discussing tonight. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Joy in just a moment to introduce our speakers, but first I wanted to give some general technical rules of the road. So we're going to have a Q&A section after the initial conversation. Uh, and if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A box. If you click on that box and type in questions, um, our speaker and moderator will receive them. Um, you can do that at any point over the course of the conversation. So if you have a question, you don't have to wait to the end to submit it. Uh, and we will gather up and then once the initial conversation is over, we will start a conversation with you all the audience. So Joy, I'm gonna hand it over to you and thank you all so much again for being here. Thank you so much, Thomas. Hi everyone, my name is Joy Yamaguchi. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Japanese American National Museum. And just wanted to thank you and welcome you on behalf of the museum for being here with us tonight. Um, we also are just so excited to partner with Pacific Council. Um, just this topic also, I mean, not only is it relevant to us because it is Japanese American history and such an important part of our community's history, but also we believe at the museum that our mission is to use the lessons of the past to inform the present. Um, and I'm really excited to see how our speakers um, share just their histories and their experiences and talk about this really exciting book. Um, so yeah, I would like to just introduce our speakers at this time. Um, Karen Ishizuka is the chief curator at the, of the Japanese American National Museum, and she was previously on staff of, of the museum as the media producer, curator, and director of the Frank H. Watase Media Art Center. During that time, she curated Janum's influential America's Concentration Camps, Remembering the Japanese American Experience Exhibition, established the museum's photographic and moving image archive, and wrote and produced Toyo Miyatake, Infinite Shades of Grey, which was an official selection at the Sundance Film Festival. Together with her husband and partner, Robert A. Nakamura, Ishizuka received the inaugural Janum Legacy Award at the 2016 Janum Gala Dinner for their lasting contributions to the museum's institutional legacy and helping distinguish the museum as a unique, vital, and valuable community resource. Ishizuka received a master's degree in social work from San Diego State University and her PhD in anthropology from the University of California, Los Angeles. In addition to many articles, she is the author of Serve the People, Making, Jap Making Asian America in the Long 60s, and Lost and Found, Reclaiming the Japanese American Incarceration, and co-editor of Mining the Home Movie, Excavations into Histories and Memories. She also serves as the president of the Okura Mental Health Leadership Foundation, and she is the descendant of eight different sites of incarceration during World War II. And then our author, John Tateishi, born in Los Angeles, was incarcerated from ages three to six at Manzanar, one of America's 10 World War II concentration camps. He studied English literature at UC Berkeley and attended UC Davis for graduate studies. After living and working in London, he began teaching at the English department at the City College of San Francisco, and in 1975, became involved with the redress program of the Japanese American Citizens League, the nation's oldest and largest Asian American civil rights organization. Um, sorry. He played important roles in leading the campaign for Japanese American Regis as the chair of JCL's National Committee for Regis and the JCL's Regis Director, the latter a position he held until he left the campaign two years before its successful culmination with the enactment of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. Later appointed the JCL National Director, he used the lessons of the campaign after the terrorist attacks on 9-11 when he called upon JCL chapters across the nation to support and protect Muslim and Arab communities against public backlash and spoke out publicly against the dangers of scapegoating the Arab and Muslim communities as the nation had done to Japanese Americans following the attack at Pearl Harbor. Under his leadership, the JCL became an important national voice in challenging the administration's post 9-11 policies that undermined the civil liberties of Americans. And with that, we are so excited to have them tonight. And I would like to welcome Karen and John to carry on this conversation. 
Okay. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Joy. Um, uh, you know, back in the day when we had live events, um, John and I would be sitting on this brightly lit stage and looking out into a very dark audience. So we wouldn't be able to see you anyway. So I, I'm just assuming that you're all out there somewhere. Um, but we really appreciate your joining us tonight. You know, I know that in these days, there are many, many Zoom meetings and webinars, and you could be just binging on Netflix. But so we really appreciate your being here today. Uh, you know, John and I go back um, quite a few years. Uh, you know, we, we were back, go back to the 1970s, actually, uh, when I was one of those L.A. sanseis, uh, third generation Japanese Americans that he talks about in his book, um, who were outraged when we discovered camp because we never learned about it in school and our parents and grandparents and family didn't talk about it either. Um, so I'm just so personally delighted to be back in touch with John and be in conversation with him with his amazing book. Um, you know, before we get into the book, John, I'd like you to summarize, you know, if you would, you know, what the redress reparations movement was all about. We started this whole enterprise. Actually, it wasn't the JCL that began redress. That, that started in Los Angeles on the streets uh, with activists um, in the Japantown community there. The JSL adopted a, a resolution in 1970 to place redress or the internment issue, incarceration, as part of a major plan of action. And it was essentially to start the conversation within the organization. The whole idea of reparations for the JSL was to um, codify the experience in our minds so that we could understand what happened to us. Because Japanese Americans at, at the outset of the campaign really didn't understand a lot about what had taken place and why we ended up in those camps. And we started with the assumption that the government needed to understand that what happened to us, the policy, was really racist, based solely on race. And so we started pushing this issue through the organization to talk about reparations for um, the actions, the treatment of Japanese Americans during World War II. And it was intended as a way to inform the American public about what had happened to us, because those of us who were involved in the campaign realized that most Americans had no idea this had happened. And so part of the, the emphasis of the campaign was to educate the public. And once we reached a certain point in that, to start pushing for legislation to um, resolve this issue. The ultimate goal for the JSL was monetary redress and an apology, which was we were able to do after 10 years of a public campaign. So it's really to address what happened to us during the war, because no one in this country really understood that. And the people who did know about it believed that we were there because we had been disloyal to the country. And so we needed to establish the facts about our experience during World War II to make the public understand that um, we were put into these camps without any charges ever filed against us, and that we were the innocent victims of a, a racist policy. Yeah, so you know, in, uh, just to recap, you know, the redress reparations movement was really a 10-year struggle um, to obtain redress and reparations for this mass incarceration of 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry during World War II. You know, and I think we should just remind the public that, you know, two thirds of us were US citizens by birth and that our grandparents were Japanese immigrants who were not allowed to become naturalized citizens. So they were naturally considered enemy aliens. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, you know, it's really important to understand that we were incarcerated en masse, uh, even though the US was at war with Japan, with Italy and Germany as well, 
um, and without any due process, you know, of law. You know, before we go into the book, let me just say a word about terminology. Um, you know, and I, I refer to this episode as the incarceration, which includes two parallel but separate sets of detention. You know, one was the internment of 7,000 Issei immigrants, uh, most of whom were picked up like both of my, grand, my grandfathers the night of December 7th and placed in some 30 detention camps and internment centers run by the Department of Justice. And then the subsequent, um, the second one was the subsequent imprisonment of 120,000 uh, men, women, and children into 10 concentration camps run by the War Relocation Authority. Um, you know, so, and John, you know, as explains in his book, uses the term internment to include both of these uh, parallel sets of detention. Um, you know, which, as he explains in the preface, is was the common usage uh, of the event during that during that time. So we would be both talking about internment and incarceration, but we're really talking about the same thing. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, you mentioned already that I'd like to emphasize is how little known the incarceration was uh, to the American public when you began the redress campaign. You know, both to the American public and actually to ourselves as well. You know, as I mentioned that, you know, as I, as a Sansei third generation, did not know anything about it. We didn't learn it at school. Our parents didn't tell us anybody about it. And, you know, as you write in the book too, um, not even civil rights organizations like the ACLU or the NAACP uh, were supportive. Uh, so, and there was also some pushback from the community itself, you know, that we should let bygones be bygones and um, that old coping mechanism really that pretty much all people of color had learned for survival is just to shut up and not call attention to yourself. So can you tell us a little bit more about how little the public knew uh, about this and then how and why it, it resulted in a commission rather than a bill for reparations? You know, uh, before I took the national stage with the JSL on, on the redress movement, I was the Northern California District representative for the National Redress Committee. And because there was no um, directive from the committee, the National Committee, I started doing various things on my own. And one of the things that really surprised me was that uh, I did a talk show here in the Bay Area. I'm in, in the San Francisco area. And the calls that came in uh, really shocked me because there were people who called in and said, you're lying. This never happened. We don't do that kind of thing. This is America. We don't imprison people. And I realized that even in liberal, the liberal Bay Area, there were people who were totally ignorant about what occurred to us during World War II. And the more I explored this with the public, you know, I would take any invitation I got to speak. Um, the more I talked to the public about it, the more I realized if people in the Bay Area are unaware of this, can you imagine once you go across the mountains into the East Bay, um, into that rural area, and then go over the Sierras into the rest of America, People won't know anything about this. And that was my experience. So that what I realized was there is no way we could run a campaign without first um, educating the American public. We had to go out there and fight this battle as a public education campaign because to try to get a bill in Congress to get money for what happened to us when the majority of Americans either don't know about it or think that what happened was justified, we didn't stand a chance in hell. So my whole strategy was to try to initiate some kind of plans to educate the public. And the, the key for us came to us in a meeting with the four Japanese American members of Congress. This was at the end of uh, 1978, beginning of 1979. 
there was Daniel Inoue in the Senate with Spark Monsnaga, both senators from Hawaii, Norman Mineta, a congressman from uh, the San Jose area, and brand new to the Senate at that, or the House, uh, was Bob Matsui, just recently elected. We went to that meeting to present our plan for reparations. We had a money bill designed, and we talked about it, and in the meeting, Inoue said, have you guys considered a commission? And he laid out this whole strategy for how a commission would help serve our needs and also help us get legislation through the Congress. And it was a plan that was designed uh, initially to create a, a federal record, a government record about what happened. And um, that was really important. That became the crux of the legislative tool that we would use. So the, the design was we would have hearings in major Japanese American population areas in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, and would have Japanese American testify. This whole thing was based on Japanese American voices talking about our own experience. We had never done that. The country had never heard this before. And so the hearing started, we, we set up a schedule and the hearing started in Los Angeles, three days there, three days San Francisco, three days in Seattle, and two days in Chicago. It was a horrifying experience because it was so painful, so emotional. And the, I realized sitting through these hearings, I sat through every single day of these hearings, I realized that the, the depth of the pain and the wound that the Nisei felt was really so traumatic that there were, we needed to find a way to resolve all this, not just for us, but for the country, because we needed to have a way to heal from this in order for us to be able to move forward with a campaign. The idea of the Nisei testifying before an official body of the government was at best, or at least a high risk strategy, because um, as Karen mentioned, no one talked about the internment, the, the whole incarceration experience. It was almost forbidden for us in the community as children to talk about it with the adults. We were in concentration camps. We came back and came back with a sense of guilt and shame. And we had, no way to resolve that because there was no one who stood up for us and explained that this was it was wrong it shouldn't have happened ours was the only voice that could talk about what happened to us and so to set up this process where the nisei they had to testify i mean the nisei were the most important generation in this whole experience because they were the ones who were adults when this happened the rest of us, someone like me, I was, I was a kid. So my, what I went through was very different from what Anise went through. But to have a process where they were gonna speak publicly about something they would not talk about, not even to their own children born after the war. So you have this whole generation of a blank legacy about that one period of time in our history. And to get the Anise to come in and, and talk about this in front of an audience, to do it publicly, knowing there would be cameras there, was so high risk that if we failed at that, we would never, ever get reparations. There was no way we could advance this whole issue. But what surprised me and what, what was really, really gratifying to see was that the Nisei wanted to talk. They felt this need to, to talk. And I realized from the outset that this was the catharsis we never had. And so the Nisei started preparing their testimonies. And day after day, they got up there. Um, there were se over 700 witnesses, public witnesses, who talked about their own personal experience. And everything everyone talked about, it was kind of a repetition of the same experience, the same thing, theme, but with different personal experiences, different kinds of pain and injury and um, it was amazing to see this whole thing 
sort of unfold because um, one after another, every witness broke down. And I have never in my life seen Nisei men cry in public until that moment. And it wasn't just one or two, everyone broke down. And I sat there and was just, I felt really awful because I thought, my God, you know, I was part of this. I, I created this monster. But one by one, they got up there and they talked about it. And you could sense in the audience that we were getting stronger that something, there was a transformation taking place. And by the time we finished the hearings in Chicago, by the time the commission addressed all of these issues, heard all these witnesses and finished the hearings in Chicago, they returned to Washington and started this, the process of uh, writing a report. And that report came out, it, it was the first time there was an official report by the government about the experience of Japanese Americans during World War II. And it was a report, 400 page report titled, Personal Justice Denied. And it laid out point by point how that injustice occurred. And it's, it's unequivocal in stating that it was not because of anything other than race. And so they list uh, the things that caused it. One was war hysteria. Uh, the other was a failure of leadership and racism. And they talk about race as a major factor that drove this whole decision. So for us, it was important to get that report, to get the, the government to acknowledge that something had been done and done without justification. Because until then, we were the only ones saying we were innocent. The rest of the country said that you, what happened to you was something you deserved. And some people used to say, when I, when I did talk shows around the country, some people would actually say, and I think we should have done more to you. And they saw as, us as traitors to the United States. We're American citizens. So the report became one of the most important lobbying tools we had. And once we got that, the commission came out a few months later with recommendations of an apology, twenty-five or $20,000 per person affected by the, the orders and the creation of a trust fund, which would be developed as a, an educational trust fund. And after that, those recommendations came out, we had, the JSL had committed to adopt the recommendations um, as the legislative language for our reparations bill. That, that was really risky because we didn't know if they would come out with recommendations. We didn't know what the, what the report would say, but those of us who had seen documents in the archives knew the report could only say one thing. I mean, it was so clear from all the evidence I ever saw in the archives that it was a manipulation against us but it wasn't, that wasn't something we were really sure about when it came to the recommendations. I mean, the, the commission could have come out with $3,000 per person, 5,000. Our figure that we were demanding was $25,000 per person affected by the government's orders. The commission came out with a figure of 20,000 and the JSL accepted that and uh, we took literally uh, verbatim the recommendations of the commission and wrote that into legislative language and that became the redress bill and the bill that eventually passed in 1988. Yeah, I think, you know, now we, we know that this is history and your book has added the details to that history. But, you know, I think that history just doesn't happen. You know, it really is, a, was a grassroots effort by Japanese Americans across the board. And at the time, it was like taking three steps forward and two steps backwards. You know, I was with the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations, which was another major organization that helped gain redress. There was also NCJAR, the National Coalition for Japanese American Redress. And I remember, you know, just personally thinking, you know, when the commission came out was why do we need a, you know, a government commission to tell us 
whether or not an injustice occurred. It was obvious to us on the inside. And I think that, you know, as your book goes into, that was a bone of contention uh, amongst the Japanese American community. You know, so, you know, any kind of national massive campaign like this is not without its tensions and it's something that, you know, you go into and, and um, really pay attention to. And, you know, when we at NCRR2, when we heard about the commission that, you know, okay, so there is going to be an ex a commission, we will accept this and we will support it, but how are we going to get the Nisei to speak, you know, when they wouldn't even speak to us as their children? So that was, you know, that was a real concern, as you mentioned. And, you know, I, I conducted a, I, I did a, um, a uh, play called The Truth of the Matter, uh, with Nobu McCarthy and um, Rodney Kageyama, uh, Ernie, um, and, and, you know, it was a, a way to try to outpicture some of the emotions that we knew was going on to help encourage people to talk. But, you know, as you said, you know, it, it was really the catharsis that we didn't even know we needed. And, you know, when it came time to it, we, there were massive people. I was there at the Los Angeles hearings, and there were so many people there who wanted to speak. Um, there was a time limit because there were so many people. Uh, it was really a shame to have to cut them off because they had waited for 40 years to tell their story. Uh, so, you know, I really concur that it was really a remarkable event and you know in hindsight then we really realize what uh, Senator Dan and others had suggested and knew kind of all along that we needed this national um, commission to really bring out our stories and to have them make the decision that it was wrong rather than for us to say that that it was wrong. You know so, the other thing about that Karen was that I was monitoring the, the media, and every day those hearings took place, this ran on the front pages of the major newspapers around the country, and it aired on, in those days, there were only three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS. It ran on their evening news stories. So it was getting a lot of national exposure. And you know, I had said in this meeting, you know, you're gonna, if you do this right, you'll get more publicity through this than you, the JACL, could afford to pay for. And he was absolutely right. That was one of the real values that I saw in doing this commission. And the other part was the catharsis. I knew it was gonna be difficult. I knew it was gonna be risky. I had no idea it would have the impact it did on the Nisei. And I'm really thankful that that worked out. It could have been a disaster. But it did work out and, you know, thankfully, it gave us the, the momentum to come together and fight for a money bill. So the, the uh, Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, you know, the, the report concluded, you know, as you mentioned, and I think it's worth repeating, that the car incarceration was not justified by military necessity as the country and we had been told at the time. But instead, the government commission maintained was that it was due to race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. And I think we really need to underscore that failure of political leadership, especially right now. Um, you know, and it also provided you know, an official apology by the US government and the token monetary reparations of 20,000 to camp survivors and people affected who are still alive, by the way, you know, who were, it was to everybody, it was to those who people who were still alive. And, you know, most of my grandparents, most of the Issei were already gone by then. But, you know, one thing I'd like to really emphasize is how significant the apology was. Uh, and that was really the most important part of this. Um, the, uh, the apology is, you know, an, uh, to get an official apology by the U.S. government is extremely rare. And I, if I'm not mistaken, this was only the second time 
that the US government had ever, ever issued an unofficial apology. Um, I think the first one was for shielding Klaus Barbie uh, for his war crimes in 1983. And you know, this, as you said, was the, it was in 1988. So that, you know, just having an official apology is extremely, extremely important. Well, you know, the whole idea of, of trying to get redress or reparations from the United States government has always been seen as a doomed to failure effort. It had never happened. No one had ever been able to do this because of the apology. You cannot do it without first getting the apology. When we went to that meeting with the four Japanese American members, uh, Inoue did raise the point of an apology. And I said, oh, the hell with that. We don't want an apology. You know, it, words from apologies from politicians are meaningless. And we already had that. Gerald Ford issue, issued an official apology in this document called The American Promise. And so we didn't want the apology. In fact, in our guidelines, it was part of our, our guidelines and we took it out, that is we, the JA self, took it out because of that feeling about it. And we thought, we want the money. The money is what really matters because that's the statement. That's how you rectify wrongs through the United States judicial, judicial system. But Inoue said it's really important and we let that go at that point, but later on, as I was working with the commissioners, trying to work out the recommendations, I didn't ever talk to the research staff. I had to vow not to interfere with that. But I was free to talk to the commissioners about how much the recommendations were going to be. And um, Inoue and I had several conversations about the apology issue. And it finally, I realized what he was saying that you need the apology in order to be able to make the payment because without apologizing, it's not acknowledging the wrong. Yeah, I and I thought, wow, that, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's kind of a subtle thing in terms of the politics of it, but it was critical. So it was the first thing, as I was lobbying the commissioners, I was saying the money first and you know, somewhere in there an apology. After I'm, I realized what Inori was saying, I switched my whole strategy and said, we need the apology first. That has to be at the top of the list. And that in fact was what made it so difficult because the Congress had never apologized for past actions and paid reparations for it ever. So because of the apology part of it, it made it much more difficult. But in the end for us, for Japanese Americans, for the Nisei mainly, it was the apology that really mattered. The money didn't matter at all. I mean, yeah, you know, 20,000, three years of imprisonment for 20,000. You've got to be kidding me to say that, you know, that's justice rectified. It was symbolic. But what really mattered to the Nisei, and I, I felt this all along as we were pushing money, the money bill through, I kept saying, you know, the money won't matter. We need the money for you to say, that you recognize the wrong. But for us, the apology is what matters for you to acknowledge it. And there were enough members of Congress who understood that. And so there was a letter of apology written by the president as the checks were being sent out. And I used to say, you know, the Nisei, they don't care about the money. They're gonna give the money away. And most of them did. But what they, they held on to was that letter of apology. It became so meaningful for, for everyone. And so the money went to trust funds, they went to organizations, they went to like the museum, uh, they went into education funds for grandkids, that, those sorts of things. But when I would go visit some, some Japanese American family, what I would see framed on the wall was that letter. And it, you know, it happens so often. I realized in, in sort of a real experience that this really, I, you know, I used to say this over and over, but this is really true, that it meant that much to them. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, the apology goes into, you know, you end your book uh, when you were the national president of the JCL, and that's when 9-11 happened. National director. You know, I think you had, um, 
you talked about it evoking memories of the racism um, after Pearl Harbor and that we had as Japanese Americans almost a moral obligation as a people who had been racially profiled uh, to respond, you know, and intervene. So can you talk about um, the just the 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 sort of deja vu of 9-11 and then, you know, we'd like to to close with your part with uh, sort of the deja vu now with COVID-19. But if you could talk about the 9-11 what people don't remember necessarily is that we were in a really vicious trade war with Japan and we were being blamed for Japan's policies to the extent that there was a young man named Vincent Chin who was killed in Detroit by two unemployed auto workers. So we, we always face this forever foreigner dilemma, even though of uh, Asian Americans in this country are American citizens. After 9-11, we took a, it was a, a different kind of situation for us because we weren't the target anymore. It was the Arab and Muslim community in this country where uh, there was this backlash. We had, as, as Karen points out, we had an obligation, a moral obligation to get involved with that because we are the only community in the United States that understood what this would mean because we were, we were once victims of it. So we worked with the Arab, Arab and Muslim communities to try to help protect them from the backlash that we could see was just sweeping across the country. Um, in the JSL, we divided the work up. The chapters who are the rank and file of the organization, the volunteers, they were out there in the community. Uh, and the JSL has chapters all over the country. The, we have regional directors who kind of directed the chapters. And one of the things we, we tried to do was coordinate everything from the ground level all the way up to the work I was doing, which was working with members of Congress and working with the media. And what I found really interesting is that we were doing, we were fighting the same battle. That is, we were trying to educate the public about the Arab and Muslim, Muslim communities and using our experience and using that commission report to say that, you know, it was wrong in 1942 and 40 years later, we came back and demanded reparations to correct the wrong. And I would say there were 120,000 of us in 1942. Now we're looking at somewhere around 3 million. There isn't enough money in the U.S. Treasury to pay reparations for this if you do this. There were members of Congress who were talking about doing the same thing. They were saying, you know, as a matter of security, we need to and detain all of these people because we don't know who among them might be a terrorist. And I would argue with them and say, yeah, you know, there are terrorists in America. The FBI has a list of all of them. And they all happen to be in places like Montana and Idaho and South Carolina and Idaho. I mean, I'm sorry, in uh, Indiana. And I don't see anyone trying to round them up because they were white. But it was purely a racist thing that was happening after 9-11. Uh, what was interesting also is that a lot of Nisei came to see me and they were going through PTSD. It, it was recalling everything about 1942 for them. And a lot of them were just traumatized. And so we were trying to work with our community, but we also were focusing in the JSL, focusing our attention on trying to protect Arabs and Muslims from the kind of racist, racist attacks that they were going to experience. And I think we played a role, but I'll tell you quite honestly, the one person who was the hero of all of that, of preventing it, was Norman Mineta because he, at that time, was the Secretary of Transportation under George W. Bush. And Norm tells a story of, he could just see it in the eyes during cabinet meetings, knowing who really favored or was, were uh, urging a roundup and detention of Arabs, Arabs and Muslims. So he would sit in these cabinet meetings and 
he could tell they just wanted to say something. And I don't know, Karen, if you've ever seen Norminetta mad, you don't want to be at the other end of that, that glare that he has. He can be pretty intimidating. And he told me once, you know, I would just stare them down. They wouldn't dare say it with me in the room. So as I say in my book, you know, sometimes it's not just being there for what you contribute, but for what you prevent from being said. And I think it was a really concerted if effort by the entire Japanese American community to help in any way we could to prevent a backlash against those people who were the target after 9-11. Yeah. So I think, you know, you talked about, you know, sort of the crazies that came out at the time. Um, you know, and, and you had said at one point that, you know, they basically said to you, good Americans like me are here to get rid of people like you. You know, and now we're in the midst of another kind of backlash uh, with the pandemic, the COVID-19. Uh, we have over 100 hate crimes against Asians a day. Um, so can you comment too about how, you know, th this, this again is almost a deja vu and that the fight that you began you know, continues in, in many ways today. You know, I, sadly, I think Asian Americans face this. We're all as foreigners until there's so much intermixing of, of um, races that people won't be able to look and say, oh, he or she is an Asian. have to deal with constantly. And that's happening right now because there, there are a lot of, you know, it's not, not very helpful that the president identifies this. As, um, and what we're experiencing, what we're seeing is that there have been over almost 2,000 reports of um, incidents against Asians, accusing Asians of um, carrying the virus. I, I've experienced that myself, of someone accusing me of carrying the virus. And really kind of interesting. Okay, I think we're having some problems with John's um, uh, audio. Okay. I... Okay. You're on again. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, John. As, as I was saying, one of the things I've, I've always seen in people who attack Asians in this country, either verbally or uh, physically, is that they always attack women or elders or children. They don't have the guts to attack a real man. They go after the most vulnerable. And you know, it's, it's a typical cowardly kind of thing to do, but it, it's just built out of so much ignorance that anyone who looks uh, Asian, in their view, is someone who's responsible for carrying and bringing this virus to this country. It's, and you know, the absurdity is, it's almost unthinkable. I mean, when this woman said something to me to that effect, I looked at her and I said, are you really that stupid? I mean, are you really that stupid? Just because I'm Asian, you think I carry this virus. But people like that actually believe it because there is so much ignorance about Asians and uh, the unwillingness to accept us as bona fide Americans so that we will always will face this, this issue of being forever viewed as foreigners. Most of my life, I've had to deal with that. In my work, I had to deal with that. And we're certainly seeing it right now across this country. Yeah, and I think, you know, as people of color in this country, you know, I think that there is a, uh, something that we share by being of color in this country. And unfortunately, the U.S. has sort of um, dichotomized Americans as black and white. But, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, the Americans come in all colors. And as we have indicated through the years that we all 
all together make America. So, you know, this, this sort of segues into um, our question and answer time. And we do have a question um, and, uh, you know, a really great question, you know, are there any best practices or lessons learned that we can apply to help our Black African American community with their fight with obtaining redress and reparations, uh, or even an official apology for slavery? And, you know, I do think that there was an a, a apology for slavery and the Jim Crow laws, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it didn't go to the step where uh, they talked about reparations, you know, and I think that, you know, African American reparations is something that we've talked about and this country has talked about, you know, for quite a while. So you know, are there any lessons from the our reparations fight that might be applied? You know, when I was lobbying the Congress for both the commission bill and the monetary compensation bill, the can of worms in those who oppose any kind of reparations, the idea of paying money for past injustice, the can of worms in their minds was um, what they saw as black reparations. If we do it now for you, that this is gonna open that can and how do we stop it from happening in a much larger way much more profound way for African Americans. And the other argument I, I got often was, why should we pay the price for an error of a past generation? Mm -hmm. And those arguments are going to come up when you talk about black reparations, it's inevitable. One is the money, and, and I can tell you just from having dealt with this kind of comment is that uh, members of Congress will say, well, you know, the, the Great Society program of Lyndon Johnson, billions and billions of dollars spent after the Civil Rights Act um, to try to rectify the wrongs, the historical wrongs against um, the Black community. And they will say, we've already paid reparations. Well, they have and they haven't. I mean, what that proved, that program proved is that it's, you know, with all this good intent, you cannot just dump money and think you've done a community a favor. It didn't really address the root causes. And one of it is racism. I, it, unfortunately, racism is part of what America has become. And it's so much more blatant now than it was five years ago. And in my view, all it's done is, is shattered the veneer that kept those who were really angry uh, from speaking out. Right now, I don't know, I can't see anyone being able to progress anything with a civil rights intent, any kind of legislation, not with the Congress the way it is now. It's so bipartisan and so divided and angry at everything that, um, we would not have been able to get our reparations bill through at all in the, in the climate today. It's, it's going to take time. Uh, John Conyers was fighting that fight back in 1975, 76. And as much as he yearned to try to get a bill through, it was difficult. And at that time, it was a Congress that worked together. And that was the only reason we were able to succeed. But um, the setbacks that have been caused by the bipartisanship in the past few years has really changed the way uh, you can do legislation. Virtually, you can't get any legisl legislation passed because if a Democrat sponsors something, the Republicans will reject it and vice versa. And it's become this not even a tug of war. It's become this, you know, throwing uh, all kinds of stuff at each other and not trying to uh, resolve it. The only thing I can say about um, Af uh, African American reparations is that, um, unfortunately, because of what's happening now, you're going to have to let things settle. It's going to take a while to get back into a conversation where both sides will listen to you. And until that happens, nothing will happen. And it's going to be a struggle, even in the best of times. But 
the one thing that was different about ours is no one knew about our situation. No one knew what had happened to us. As much as that was an issue and a problem, at least we could change things. But everybody knows about slavery in this country. And so what you're dealing with isn't so much educating people, it's about changing attitudes. Eventually, I think that will happen. It's just going to take a, an awful lot of time to do that. Okay, so we have you know about eight minutes left. Uh, I'd like to remind the audience that um, you can ask a question at the Q and A um, at the bottom of your screen, and um, I'll be able to see it there. We have another question of uh, how can Sansei and younger Japanese Americans continue the memory of both the internment and redress? What possibility is there that these events will be forgotten as we move further away from them in time? You know, and I just would like to make, you know, a comment that, you know, I see, you know, I'm a Sansei, third generation, but I actually see the Yonsei, the fourth generation, and Gosei, you know, almost coming at this as we did, that it was a discovery, that it was something that that was that they didn't realize, and that it, it's actually given them some insight, you know, into how they were raised and how their parents, what their parents and grandparents went through. Uh, so I actually see that they, that you know, many, many, many of them. Uh, are taking it, you know, very seriously and will continue. You know, I used to call it, you know, when I first found out about the camps, you know, I used to call it that we had like barbed wire of the mind. And then, you know, a friend of, a friend of mine um, who's, a gose, or who's a Yonsei, you know, he said that it, he feels like he has barbed wire in his blood, in his veins. So, you know, that's a much more visceral sort of um, feeling that, you know, mine was, you know, a little more cognitive. But, John, do you have some, you know, ending thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I think it's really up to the Yonsei to pick up the mantle where we've placed it. I mean, we've made it publicly known now, and this is part of our legacy. We're no longer ashamed of what we experience, and we're no longer at a point where we're trying to convince people of this thing ever happening. It's part of our legacy, it's, it's out there. We celebrate um, at different times of the year, different aspects of what happened to us. You know, EO 9066, the executive order. Uh, we have pilgrimages to the camps and uh, in various ways, we won't let that memory die because we were the, the, we're the last generation that experienced it and we're all getting older. And so it, the Yonsei and Gosei, the next two generations, really have to embrace that history of ourselves. I, I think it's really important because it gives it to the, the nation as a gift to understand something about our history. And you know, I'm a firm believer in what Santayana said about not repeating the mistakes of the past, but only if you understand what that past was. And it's important for the next generations to continue to educate the American public about it, because I will guarantee you there are people now who are young out there who don't know this happened and will say, you're lying about it. We don't do that in America. So it's a constant process of educating people. And as long as you do that, it's, it, keeps our legacy alive. And it's, a, it's an important and really proud legacy. So, you know, I, I'm really confident and uh, encouraged by how much the Yonsei have embraced all of this. And they're preserving the culture by doing it. So we do stand on the shoulders of our generations and ancestors, and we do inherit that legacy of camp and and redress. You know, let me just remind you to that this is the what John's book looks like. Um, many thanks to Heyday Books for publishing it and Skylight Books for suggesting that we have this um, this conversation today. Uh, the book is available at the Japanese American National Museum store as well as Skylight Books. Um, 
you know, and it's, you know, I had told John before that I think that, you know, it, it is from his personal point of view, uh, and it really tells a blow by blow of what went on as he experienced it. And he was in the fire for 10 years on this. Um, but he also, besides the topic, you know, I was telling him that I really appreciated his personal way of telling the story. It's a very uh, exciting read. It's a very engaging read, you know, and he also divulges and lets you in on some of the behind closed doors, um, decisions, strategies, you know, and I think this is something that's really invaluable for any of us working with communities, organizing, you know, especially young people. Um, I think it's something that is not talked about um, a lot, and I really appreciate, John, that you had included that, you know, in your book. So I'm going to wrap it up at this point. I think there was a couple more questions, and I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to them. Um, you know, special thanks to Pacific Council for International Policy uh, for, for organizing this. This was really something, and I really personally thank them for, for connecting me to John again. Uh, and then also to the Japanese American National Museum, our co-sponsor. Um, and for all of you, like I said, for taking the time tonight to, to be with us. I know that there are many things other than this that you could be doing, uh, but we hope you um, got something out of it, have, have some food for thought, and um, continue to, to be engaged citizens of this United States. So thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much.